Well, welcome to IWP and this lecture. Um, for those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including three online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff. They're all in the back there at the conclusion of this event or visit iwp.edu. We'd like to thank all of our supporters who make our IWP events program possible. To support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu. All right, well, today we will hear from Brian Johnson, who will give a lecture entitled The World of Lobbying and Current State of Politics on Capitol Hill. Mr. Johnson is an experienced government and public affairs executive with over 15 years of nonprofit advocacy, trade association, multi client representation, political campaign fundraising, excuse me, and management experience. Throughout his career, Mr. Johnson has developed and executed numerous strategic government and public affairs campaigns, drafted and had countless pieces of legislation introduced and secured tens of millions of dollars in targeted appropriations, worked intimately on and helped pass, for example, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, and was named The Hills, as in the publication, Top Lobbyist 2020 list. Currently, Brian serves as the Vice President of Government and Public Affairs for Veterans Guardian, the largest veteran-owned and operated disability claims consulting company in the world helping tens of thousands of veterans every year secure benefits that they are legally, ethically, and morally and medically entitled. In this capacity, Brian manages all lobbying, public affairs campaigns, and political giving as the head of the company's DC operations. <clears throat> Politically, Brian advises on dozens of political campaigns, serves on several elected official steering committees, and is heavily involved in local politics. As a policy expert, he has testified before Congress, and his expert commentary has been featured on BBC, CNN, C-SPAN, Fox News, Fox Business News, PBS, Real Clear Politics, and many more. With that, please join me in welcoming Brian Johnson. Shorten that introduction. That was way too long. No, no. All right. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, we are going to have a conversation about lobbying, what is lobbying, and then we're going to talk about the current state of political affairs, and um, maybe we'll talk about the election. Who knows? Um, but I want you guys to ask questions. I'm not going to sit up here and talk to you for an hour. Trust me, nobody wants to hear that. Um, so I'm probably going to do about 30 minutes and then have a robust Q&A. And I have, unfortunately, been talking all day, so I will be utilizing this throughout. All right. So what is lobbying? What do you guys think lobbying is? Anybody want to give me a short sentence on what encapsulates lobbying to you? Yes, ma'am. Just an idea, but it's just the fact that someone is working for, for some enterprise and he, he is a kind of bridge to the politician and he goes to convince the politician to make some laws that are going to benefit the enterprise. This is the, the most basic. Someone who convinces a politician uh, on something that benefits an enterprise. That's a, that's a, that's a, good, uh, that's a good answer. Anybody else? Yes? Just one word. A promoter. A promoter. Yeah, that's really good. Um, I would say lobbying is the practiced art of persuasion. And lobbying happens every single day. It happens all around us. Um, lobbying is actually the only job that is mentioned and outlined and preserved in the US Constitution. The United States Constitution grants you the right to petition your government for the address of grievance in a manner that you see fit. And that is lobbying. Um, the right to petition your government, the right to address your government for a grievance. 
Um, in modern day, it's turned into a promotion of sense. You want to pass something or get something done. Um, in the past, it was to address harms or misgivings that happened to you as a result of some type of government action. But it truly is persuasion. And I think it's powerful that it is enumerated in the Constitution. It is part of the First Amendment, freedom of speech. You have the freedom and that right. And like I said, it does happen every day and it happens all around us. Um, many people think of sales, right? Is sales lobbying? Well, no. I would say sales is, what do I have to do to get you into this 87 Civic today, right? What do I have to do to get you into this car today? And you think of the uh, corny used salesman analogy. Um, but I would argue that lobbying is how can I present this information to you, surround you with a certain point of view, and use various tactics to get you to come to my preferred conclusion, but do it on your own and think it was your idea. And I think that that is truly what lobbying is. And so there's a lot of different types of lobbying that occurs today. There's direct lobbying where if you have ever written a letter or an angry email to your member of Congress, that was direct lobbying. Um, if I go in and say, I'd like you to pass this bill or defeat this bill on behalf of these constituents for X, Y, Z reasons, that's, that's direct lobbying. Indirect lobbying, I take the issue to the constituents and say, I want you to tell your member of Congress what X, Y, Z is. So that's more indirect lobbying. Um, grassroots lobbying. I want to go into the community and form a coalition that is going to advance my position forward. Uh, earned media. I'm going to do a letter to the editor or an op-ed that's going to convey my position in my member of Congress's biggest newspaper, so I know they're going to see it. Uh, paid media lobbying. I want to pay someone to get me on TV to talk about the issue. Um, and really, there's no good version or bad version of, of, of lobbying. It's about crafting a holistic campaign to achieve a desired objective. So for example, when I lobby, um, I'm fortunate enough to work for a company where I have a lot of tools at my disposal. And I lobby for veterans and the right for their freedoms of choice to choose how they pursue and navigate a complicated VA disability system. Um, and they have the right to hire and retain our help to, to help them do that. It's like uh, hiring an H&R Block to do your taxes. We're sort of the equivalent of that, and I know it's tax time right now and everyone's getting ready to file. If you're not, you should be. Um, but which one is better? And the answer is all of the above. And so when I look at an issue, I look at what is my objective? And it's typically to change or influence legislation, support legislation, or, or kill bad legislation. And there is some bad legislation out there that needs to be killed. Um, but the best way to do that is to take that holistic approach and use the resources available to you. And so, for example, I will go in and meet with the stakeholder directly, um, a senator, a member of Congress, uh, and convey my position. But inevitably, the answer comes back to, how does this impact my constituents? And what do my voters feel about this issue? And so we'll then go out and launch an educational campaign with the voters, where we'll run op-eds, We'll do targeted ads on meta platforms that actually follow the voters around the internet and uh, present educational information. We'll then try to get in contact with the voters and have them reach out directly to their elected officials uh, through an email campaign, phone campaign, things like that. We'll supplement that with earned media, paid media. And what that does is it results in an echo chamber whereby the elected individual is hearing these messages from all different sources. And it's not just coming from me. And that is what truly provides a holistic uh, campaign to support a, a lobbying effort. Um, like I said, there's no good way to do it. There's no bad way to do it. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. But if you can craft that holistic approach where the elected official is sort of surrounded with those messages, then you're more likely to uh, get your point across. What is lobbying not? Lobbying is not delivering bags of cash to elected officials. Um, now, in the 1800s, um, so lobbying is said to have started um, just after the Civil War, 
where people who had issues with, it was usually land and titles and things of that nature, um, again, after the war, would wait in the lobby of the popular Willard Hotel, geography, where am I, right over here, um, and literally wait for presidents and senators and members of Congress to, to lobby. So they would wait in the lobby, hence lobbying. Not very original, I know. Um, but that's where it's alleged uh, to come from. And back then, there were not rules and restrictions on lobbying. Um, you literally could give endless amounts of money to these individuals. You could shower them in gifts, late night parties, whatever nefarious activities happened there. Um, but there was no guardrails on it. Today, there are a lot of guardrails. Um, if you contact your elected official and write them a letter that doesn't meet the threshold of what is legally required to register as a lobbyist. So we have something called the Lobbying Disclosure Act. So I, as a lobbyist, am registered with the House and Senate Ethics Committee. I have to disclose all of my political contributions above $200. I have to disclose every law and every bill that I lobbied on. I have to disclose all of the other lobbyists and firms that I might pay. Um, I have to disclose my PAC, my political action committee that our company has, and the money that we give. And I am forbidden from providing any gift to a covered official, so a staffer, member of Congress, etc., that is above $20 in value. Um, there's something called a pre-existing relationship clause as well. So if I knew you since we were kids, and then you go and work on Capitol Hill, and I want to give you a $200 gift card for Christmas. I can do that. But you have to disclose that you got that gift. I have to disclose that I gave you that gift. And we have to establish a pattern of a pre-existing gifting relationship. So it is very, very hard to sort of buy a vote. Um, now, there are, of course, political campaign contribution limits. It's uh, $3,300 uh, per year for an individual to give for the primary, and another 3,300 for the general. Uh, PACs have a $5,000 uh, a year giving limit, um, but there are, of course, super PACs and leadership PACs and other ways where you can give more money. Um, but is that inherently bad or good? Um, again, the First Amendment, your freedom of expression is protected by your ability to financially contribute to these members. Does it make a difference? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Members that you get to know and that are in tough races, you want to financially support them. But there are rules and restrictions around when that money can come in and how that money cannot be tied to specific legislative asks. Um, for example, I cannot discuss fundraising inside a Capitol building. Uh, inside the House, the Senate, the White House, you cannot have fundraising conversations. Um, those occur at the DNC, the RNC, and, and, and off campus. Um, you also cannot say, I will donate to you if you will vote for my bill. That is highly illegal. Um, and you definitely don't want to ever put that in writing. Um, as some people have gotten in trouble before, <clears throat> Jack Abramoff, you guys can Google him afterwards. <laughs> but is lobbying inherently good or bad? Or is it a necessary evil? What do you guys think? Show, show of hands for good. <laughs> show of hands for just inherently bad. Ooh. Ooh, okay. I got, I got some work to do here. Showing hands for a necessary evil. Yeah, kind of more of the, you know, see a couple hands in the back there. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting how people look at lobbying and, and look at lobbyists. I think one, you know, it is a constitutionally protected right. You have the right to petition your government on behalf of yourself or an entity. It's expressly prohibited in the Constitution and we shall not infringe upon those inheritable rights. On the other hand, I think it has gotten a bad rap. Uh, House of Cards, for example, anyone seen that? There's a lot less murder in real life lobbying, I'm telling you. Like almost none, but definitely a lot less. The rest of it's pretty much on point. Um, let me read a couple quotes about lobbying I found interested. Too often the government responds to the whispers of lobbyists before the cries of the people. That was Andrew Cuomo. Are whispers of lobbyists not cries of the people? A am I not a person? 
Am I not someone who represents constituents, people, voters, businesses? I think the answer is yes, I am. But that's how the two get conflated. Let's see another one. Uh, Trump has the courage to stand up to Wall Street, to K Street lobbyists, and say our trade deals have not been the best for ordinary, average American citizens. Virgil Good. Well, I'm a lobbyist, and I used to work on trade, and I was definitely a part of those deals. So that is not 100% a true statement, but does it make, again, lobbyists inherently good or inherently bad? Um, I think one of the things that lobbying brings, and we'll talk about this in a minute because I want your thoughts on term limits, hot subject now, and age limits. Um, being around and doing this for a long time, you know, I bring a wealth of knowledge on issue topics that your average staffers may not have. Um, starting salaries on the Hill are about $30,000. Um, senior staff are tapped at 170. Um, and they're incentivized to only spend a limited amount of time on Capitol Hill and then leave. And then go make more money if they can. Um, and use their knowledge that they learned of how the system works inside to benefit them financially when they leave. But what does that mean? It means high turnover. So when you're constantly educating um, on the House side, it's usually mid to late 20s to early 30s staffers. On the Senate side, it's typically uh, late 20s to early to mid 40s, sometimes 50 and 60 year old staffers. Um, you bring a knowledge base that they may not have. And so because I've been doing this for a long time, I'm able to come in and within 30 minutes give a succinct presentation that hits all the points, answers their questions, and I'm a resource for them. And so many people think of Capitol Hill and D.C. as kind of a revolving door. And I do think that if we paid our staffers more, um, they would be incentivized to stay and you would have to rely less on your private sector experts. But the reality is we are the experts in our field and, you know, we need to be able to educate them and, and have that ability. Um, John Boehner, former Speaker Boehner, said, Mr. President, referring to President Obama, uh, the buzzsaw that your health care bill ran into wasn't lobbyists and special interests. It was tens of millions of Americans who were saying, stop. I would argue those tens of millions of Americans were spurred to engage by lobbyists and by special interests. Um, but at the end of the day, again, why are we delineating lobbyists from ordinary regular people? You know, we are representing people, businesses, issues, constituents. And I think far too often, as I said before, the two get conflated. So this is an interesting quote um, by Tom C.W. Lynn, who wrote uh, The Capitalist and the Activist, uh, Corporate Social Activism and the New Business of Change. This longstanding bipartisan revolving door between government and business reflects the inconvenient realities of life in a capitalist democratic republic. On the one hand, when working well, this revolving door allows businesses and government to draw on talented, ethical individuals from the private and public sectors to serve the interests of both shareholders and citizens. On the other hand, this revolving door can lead to corrosive cronyism and corruption that eats away at the integrity of both businesses and government as narrow interests are served to the detriment of shareholders and citizens. Well, that's a pretty deep point, but I think it's accurate. I think at its worst, lobbying at one point in the 90s was a source of corruption, greed, and a contaminants on society. And I think that's why Congress rightfully passed the Lobbying Disclosure Act and other rules to rein in those practices. And I think right now it works pretty well. And I don't think a revolving door is necessarily a bad thing. Um, I also don't think lobbying is an inherently bad thing. I think it has a bad stigma associated to it, but I, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, and I do fundamentally believe if we paid our Hill staffers better, um, then you would have less turnover and you would have more institutional knowledge. But then you get into, well, do you really want a staffer there for 30, 40 years? Do you want a politician there for 30, 40 years? We'll talk about that when we get into the politics part of this. Um, so is lobbying good or bad? I mean, I mean, has your position maybe changed? And we'll do some Q&A at the end. But is lobbying under attack? Is the act of lobbying under attack? I'd say yes. I'd say there are entrenched bureaucracies and 
special interests that do benefit from the status quo. And I'm gonna give a real life example of something my company's dealing with right now. So in the state of New Jersey, the state has passed a law that says it is illegal for a veteran to hire someone to help them with their initial disability claim. It is illegal to seek professional help to help you navigate a complicated system. And why did they do that? They did that because their efforts on Capitol Hill have stalled and we're moving forward with meaningful reforms to the veterans disability practice on the Hill that codify best practices and how you should engage in this space. And we're reforming the accreditation system to open it up for companies like mine to become accredited. Currently we can't, unfortunately. Um, so the current system of veterans benefits, and this gets a little off topic, but it's a good example. The current system of veterans benefits, you can apply for your benefits yourself. You can go to a free service like the American Legion who are well-meaning, but honestly understaffed and under-resourced, um, or you can hire a company like mine. Um, we work on a purely contingent basis, and it's a very modest fee. Um, the current model is when you go at your own or you go to a free service and they fail you because you didn't have the option to hire expert help for your initial claim, you then get referred to attorneys. And when the attorneys get involved on the appeal side of the claim, that appeal will take as long as that attorney wants it to take. Because after five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, that attorney can legally take 33 and a third percent of the entire veteran's back pay all the way back to the initial filing date. That is the current perverse incentive we have right now in the current status quo. That can be anywhere from 50 to $120,000. The acting secretary of the Board of Veterans' Appeals testified in December that every year the appellate adjudication body approves about 7,500 claims that act as private settlements between the VA and a handful of boutique law firms where they pay out 45 to $50 million a year where relatively zero veterans see an increase in their benefits. That's the current system that we are trying to disrupt by helping a veteran on the initial claim and getting it right 90% of the time in 85 days. So the trial bar who wants to protect their monopoly over this space went to New Jersey and got a bill passed that says it is illegal you, Mr. or Mrs. Veteran, to hire someone to help with your initial claim. And we're doing this because we know better and you're too dumb, stupid, or we're gonna infantilize you to not give you the power and the choice to make that decision. So my company has currently sued the state of New Jersey and we have a case pending in the federal third circuit for violating our veterans' constitutional rights. By denying them the ability to hire someone to prepare to navigate the federal government is a blatant violation of their ability to petition their government for an address of grievance in a manner they see fit. It's also a violation of my freedom of speech as a consultant and their freedom of speech as a veteran. Um, so this is real. This is under attack. Um, and I, um, the analogy I make is very much like Uber to the taxi cab model. You know, when Uber was trying to come into the space, there was all these states, all these regula regulators who were very much supportive of the highly unionized uh, taxi cab workers at the time. And they didn't want Uber in the space. And now, where would we be without Uber or Lyft? I mean, I, I think we'd be, we'd be struggling. So... I will say lobbying is, is under attack in some ways. Um, and again, I think it's because of the entrenched special interests who don't want to see their current system disrupted by citizens and companies taking things into their own hands and by doing a little bit differently. So I think this is very important that we protect and preserve everyone's rights to lobby and engage their government in a manner that they see fit. Um, let me open it up for any questions on the lobbying side of things before I get into our state of politics, uh, the election. And before I get into that portion, I will say my comments are my own and do not reflect the position of Veterans Guardian or IWP. <laughs> any questions about lobbying or comments? Uh, you start in the front. What was your career path like to get into lobbying? Um, I majored in international affairs. I'm sorry, I majored in political science. I minored in international affairs and English literature. 
I then went to Brussels and got a master's in international trade and economic development from ESHEC. I came back and got a second master's in public administration from GW. I started working for a uh, conservative nonprofit, Americans for Tax Reform, run by Grover Norquist. Um, I then became the senior tax advisor and then ultimately the director of federal affairs for the American Petroleum Institute. I did that for about a decade. I then left and went and worked at a multi-client firm where I represented everyone from solar, timber, financial services, um, uh, startups, uh, some of the military space, um, traditional energy, hybrid battery energy. And um, that was multi-client lobbying is definitely uh, the hardest and most stressful lobbying because you're working with 10 to 20 different clients at any given time and you have 10 meetings a day and every meeting could be on a different subject and a different topic. So you have to be able to switch back and forth. And frankly, I got burnt out. Um, and so my client at the time, Veterans Guardian, made me an offer to come in-house, and I took it, and I'm very happy. But I never worked on the Hill. I always worked in campaigns. So I was more of the campaign, policy, think tanky side, and my education helped me a lot on uh, Chinese tariff lobbying and supply chain lobbying. Um, at one point, when I was with the Vogel Group, we were doing the most uh, tariff uh, cases and tariff claims for, of any firm uh, in D.C. And so having that strong educational background definitely helped. Uh, and easing into it at ATR um, gave me the exposure to the Hill without kind of throwing me right in. Um, but no, you don't have to be an attorney to be a lobbyist. No, you don't have to work on the Hill to be a lobbyist. Um, does working on the Hill help? Sure, because you get to learn that institutional process. But thankfully, I was able to pick it up on my own. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm Sasha. Um, and also... I was wondering, how do you get involved in campaigning? Yeah. So you can do it a number of different ways. The good things about campaigns and having um, recently run a campaign and been involved in a lot of campaigns is uh, they are never short on volunteers. Um, and we actually have a congressional candidate here um, but they are uh, who, who ran in the past. Um, but they are never short on volunteers. And so I would say the best way to do it, honestly, is if there's a local race you want to get involved in, or even a statewide race, just reach out to the campaign. And just email them, you know, DM them on Twitter, and just say, hey, here's who I am, here's what I'd like to do, I'd love to help. Um, they probably won't pay you, <laughs> or they probably won't pay you much, uh, but door knocking, canvassing, working to write material, helping write briefings, ghostwriting op-eds, you know, all of those things, working on the finance side, on the field deployment side. I mean, it's a great experience. I mean, I've done House races, Senate races, and presidential, and it is just fantastic, both on the volunteer grassroots policy side and on the fundraising side, and it's very, very fun. Yes, follow. Do you think, like, are you able to still have like, a work-life balance, or is that kind of just gone? <laughs> <laughs> what is a work-life balance? I have work to do tonight when I'm done with this. Um, I mean, yes and no. I mean, the reality is you have a lot of power in that position because you can say, look, I, I can give you three days a week. Or I can give you certain hours here, certain hours there. Um, or you could get deployed out to a state and you can get paid. So presidentials will pay you. The RNC and the DNC will pay you. Um, for example, we'll talk about elections here in a minute. Uh, John Tester in Montana has probably one of the most hot races in the country right now. Um, his opponent, uh, Tim Sheehy, Naval SEAL, very decorated. Um, if you reached out to, depending on your political affiliation, Tester's team or Sheehy's team, or you reached out to the DNC or the RNC and said, I want to be deployed in the field, they would fly you out there, you'd get a per diem, they'd put you up in a crappy hotel, um, and you would get to go door knocking, canvassing, working with the local party and things like that. So you really have a lot of control over kind of how you want, how you want that to go. Now, if you worked like on the Hill full-time or were a full-time multi-client lobbyist, then you have no life. Yes? Uh, oh, that's was oh. oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, mine's kind of an odd question. So you were talking about um, staffers not getting paid as much, there being uh, more institutionalized power in lobbying firms, given that it's a better financial bet for people who actually want to participate. Do you, do you think that raising the salary of people on the, on, in Capitol Hill would create more institutional kind of knowledge that would stay there? I mean, you suggested that in theory. 
And the other question is, you know, the elected officials have an accountability to their district, whereas in the private sector you have some accountability to your shareholders. So I'm just, you know, I think that might be the question of like, do you have that speech or, or not? If you want to touch on any of that, I know that might have been a little dark over there. No, not at all. It's a great question. So one, uh, yes, I think if you paid staffers more, they would stay. The biggest reason 97% of exiting Hill staff surveyed say they leave is because of pay. It's because of pay. And if you're a good staffer and you're a staff director for Senate Finance or Ways and Means on the House side, they're the tax and trade committees, very, very powerful A-list committees. Um, <clears throat> you know, your staff director, you're making 170. You've probably worked for 10 years to get yourself up to that level. So you have 10 years of institutional knowledge and you're the staff director for a committee. You are a prize pick for a lobbying firm. And they're going to offer you a $250,000 to $500,000 a year salary. And it's really hard to you know, say no to that, especially if you've been there, like I said, for 10 years. You might have a family. You know, cost of living around here is very high. I don't have to tell any of you that. So, yes, I do think if we paid them more, it would be better. Um, <clears throat> as far as accountability, I mean, I think... Everyone has an accountability to your clients, and the members of Congress have an accountability to your constituents. And I think that ultimately, <clears throat> there's rules and laws in place to protect lobbyists from doing illegal things, nefarious things, etc. Um, and I think, for the most part, you know, the lobbyists, at least that I know and that I work with, they represent their constituencies well. And their constituencies are their clients. And they're, they're hired by their clients to advocate on a position. And the members of Congress are accountable to their voters. So as a good lobbyist, one of the first things I'm going to do is get the pulse of the district and where they are. And so if I am lobbying on an ag and ethanol bill and I'm working the Iowa delegation, I'm going to want to know, okay, where is the state chapter of API, the state chamber of commerce, where are the state environmental groups, where are they on this issue, where are the voters on this issue, where are the unions on this issue, and work those constituencies and find commonalities where they essentially will do the legwork, not do the legwork, but will supplement and reinforce the efforts that I'm doing in D.C., because ultimately, any good elected official is going to look at an issue and say, where are my constituents on this? And so grassroots and grass tops engagement and localized lobbying is very, very important. Um, state lobbying is something I've never done until this year. I'm now managing 67 people in 23 states. Um, and one of the things that we're always asking that question is, where are the voters? Where are the stakeholders? Who are the main stakeholders that elected officials listen to? Depending on where you go, it's usually, a, and, and depending on if you're a Republican or a Democrat, it's usually a combination of unions, environmental groups, business groups, center right and center left organizations that have power, right? So I'm thinking Greenpeace on one side, maybe API on the other, or NFIB, National Federation of Independent Businesses, groups like that. Um, and, you know, obviously in certain parts of the country, they listen to their religious leaders and their farmers and veterans more. In other parts, it's business and labor and the tensions that always exist between organized labor and big business. It's just always there. Um, but I think it's really important to be an effective lobbyist to know where the constituencies are, know where the, know where the voting base is on the issue, and help them reinforce what you're doing on Capitol Hill. Just to follow up, is that also who changed the feasibility of certain campaigns once you know what the district is feeling? Yeah, I mean, that, you said the right word. Lobbying, lobbying issues are campaigns. So we run lobbying campaigns, literally. So my effort in Florida is different than my effort in uh, California. And so you have to change and adapt. And you really do have to be nimble. And because the strategy you went in with, you could have one meeting of the day with the chairman of a committee and based on their feedback, you have to change your entire approach. Um, or you could think um, generating an email campaign or a phone call campaign where I go to 3,000 veterans in Virginia and I have a goal of getting 100 phone calls a day for, into certain offices. Um, once that voter gets patched through to that office, 
they can say whatever they want. They may not stay on message. And so that could backfire. It also, you could get a call from someone and says, hey, are you lighting up my phones? That's really, really annoying. Please stop. And then you need to change that effort as well. But you can't tell them, if you vote for my bill, I'll turn the phones off because that's collusion and that's illegal. What you can say is, I appreciate you changing your position on this. I'll make sure your, your voters are informed on your new position. Um, but you cannot collude on camp and lobbying campaigns and things like that with elected officials. Yes? Harrison, can you talk a little bit more about the transparency that is involved as it relates to federal lobbying? Because I feel like that's why, well, one of the reasons why lobbying may get a bad rap is people think that lobbyists should be doing a whole lot of nefarious things and not being held accountable. There's a, number, a lot of reporting that goes on. Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yes. So, um, Every quarter, uh, well, when you first sign up to lobbying, you have to file what's called a LD1, which is your lobbying registration. And you do that with House and Senate ethics. It is name, social, date of birth, background check, et cetera. And then you're logged into a portal. Uh, every quarter, I have to file an LD2, which is lobbying activity. So what bills did I lobby on? What contacts did I make? What committees did I lobby on? Um, and an issue accountability tracker. Um, how much, what percentage of my time did I spend on lobbying? So in order to meet the lobbying threshold, you have to spend 20% of your time or more per quarter on engaging in the preparation or direct advocacy uh, for specific legislation. And advocacy could be pro or against, but it's got to be 20% of your time a quarter. Um, and if you're not registered and you're hitting that threshold, it can create big problems for you. Um, back when I was working at Americans for Tax Reform, we actually spearheaded an investigation where Attorney General Eric Holder opened a case into um, Andy Stern, the president of SEIU at the time, um, who was, we felt, lobbying without being registered. Uh, based on his social media accounts, his Twitter accounts, he was meeting with members all the time, he was on the Hill, based on White House visitors log, he should have hit that 20% threshold and he didn't register. It's, that, it's illegal. You shouldn't do that. I don't care who you are. You shouldn't do that. So we led an effort on transparency to, to call him out on that, especially since he's a very visible um, head of a very large labor union at the time. Um, that's the LD2. Uh, every six months, I have to file an LD203. Um, that is a form that lists uh, political contributions and payments made. Um, and I have to list all of the trade associations I'm a part of, I have to list all of the other lobbyists and firms that I have on retainer, and I have to disclose my own salary as it relates to lobbying. Um, and then again, as I stated earlier, the gifting bans and things like that. So one of the funny things in DC, we always call it the toothpick rule. So if you're at a reception and you're inviting members of Congress and their staff, um, one, it has to be a widely attended event, which means that there has to be a mix of covered officials and non-covered officials. Um, and then two, in order to meet the lobbying compliant rule, House Ethics says, well, if it fits on a toothpick, it's probably not in violation of uh, the gifting ban. So the hors d'oeuvres and things that were served for the longest time complied with the toothpick rule um, where everything was on a toothpick. Uh, so that was always a good rule of thumb. But yeah, I do think there are and there are many organizations, the American League of Lobbyists, um, there's a lot of ethical watchdog groups out there that really do keep and, and track all this stuff. Um, and because your financial disclosures are all publicly available, you know, organizations will call people out if there's some nefarious activity that it seems going on. Like if there was a member of Congress who was vehemently um, anti-gun and then turned pro-gun, uh, they'll usually go back and look at their donations and say, oh, hey, the NRA just gave you a ton of money or a bunch of their board members all maxed out to you. Like, what's up with that? So there are organizations that will call out that kind of activity. But I think the lobbying world as a whole could do better about advertising the types of disclosures and the rigorous things we have to go through um, so people don't think it's a sort of uh, smoke-filled backroom, you know, shady deals going on. Um, let's go to the gentleman in the green. Thank you. I, I just imagine that all your lobbying efforts and the lobbying profession is completely devoted to domestic affairs. 
However, are there foreign policy lobbyists or are there any opportunities to lobby for and against Ukraine, Gaza, and so forth? Uh, Great question. Is it? Is nope. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's my question. Okay, great question. Yeah. Yes, there is. So um, there's something called FARA, um, the Foreign Agent Registration Act. So there is big money to be made in representing uh, foreign entities and foreign countries in the U.S. Um, in order to do so, you have to become a foreign agent of record. Um, so let's say, well, I know, for example, Saudi Arabia hired Brownstein um, last year, and I think paid them $400,000 a month. Um, and so, but you're representing the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So the point person on that account had to register as a foreign agent. There's a couple problems with this. One, you will never get Senate confirmed ever if you are a FARA registrant. I mean... I don't know any time it's ever happened, but it creates big problems if you have future political ambitions. Um, number two, it could complicate your personal life. Um, if you register to represent Huawei, a Chinese company, and by law, Chinese headquarter companies have to have a certain member of their board of directors composed by CCP party officials, um, you may not be welcome in Taiwan. Um, other countries could literally strip you of your ability to travel to those to those places. Um, you saw this a lot in the early 2000s with Russia and the oil and gas industry. Um, you saw it with um, obviously with Ukraine. Um, but the short answer is yes, you can register in the United States to lobby on behalf of foreign companies and foreign countries. And that really comes into play when you start talking about uh, trade issues. So free trade agreements, um, trade and tariff issues, supply chain things, uh, and, and issues like that. So you can make a, I mean, it's always the, the balance, right? I mean, FARA lobbyists make a lot of money, but it complicates things. Yes, ma'am. What about lobbying within the United Nations? Lobbying within the United Nations? Yeah. I don't think the United Nations really gets lobbied, at least not directly. Um, uh, but indirectly, obviously, if you had a major issue and a foreign company hired you, when Nikki Haley was the ambassador to the UN, you would go in and meet, meet with her. Um, or you would meet with other ambassadors. But the UN as a body doesn't get lobbied like you would lobby the House and the Senate. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. I don't know if there's a prohibition on it or if it just doesn't happen, but it just doesn't happen. Uh, yes, sir, in the half zip. So what's the state of uh, politics? What's the state of politics? Oh, okay. Um, any, other qu any other questions about lobbying, I'll be happy to stick around afterwards um, or I can take some Q&A at the end. Okay. I can't see anything anymore, by the way. And these glasses are all scratched up, so I'm going to do my best. Um, in January of 2020, when Biden got elected, the country was on a 59% wrong track. So you know the right track, wrong, wrong track polls? It was 59% wrong track. It's currently 70% wrong track. 70%. 86% of voters polled think Biden is too old. And 59% think him and Trump are too old. That's a problem if you're the incumbent. That's a problem. Wrong track, right track um, is... It is a problem. Um, the fact that voters think both of them are too old is a problem. Um, but if I'm the incumbent, I'm not, I'm not feeling great. I'm not feeling great. Um, in January, Biden was at 50. Trump was at 44. Now Biden's at 49. Trump's at 45. That's the Quinnipiac poll. In other polls, Trump is at 52. Biden's at 48, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Things are very, very close right now. And I think there's a couple of factors in the presidential um, that have an impact. Um, one, uh, the former president has some legal issues. And I think that um, there are, is a large percentage of the population that may have liked the policies that he put forward, but have consternation about not only his behavior and his mannerisms, 
um, but his legal troubles as well. Uh, if those legal issues get sorted out and there is some vindication uh, of the former president, uh, I think that if I'm in the former president's camp, I'm going to feel really, really, really good about that based on, based on the polling and based on the right track, wrong track poll. Um, president Biden has had a, look, we all have gaffes. Elected officials make gaffes a lot. Um, he certainly had some moments where his uh, cognitive ability has uh, looked questionable. And I think that's a real concern for a lot of people. Um, sure, Trump confused Nikki Haley and Nancy Pelosi, but it, it seems very hard for the current president to get through long press events, to get through complicated sentences, and it just, it is what it is. I'm not, look, I'm not assigning one, one thing or another to either person. I think Trump has his personality issues and his legal issues. I think the president has his cognitive issues and his age and his health. Um, I think if something were to happen where President Biden was, for whatever reason, no longer running for reelect, um, I think the Democrats would um, nominate either Gretchen Whitmer uh, or uh, Gavin Newsom. Um, I do not think it would be the current vice president um, for, for a number of reasons. Um, and I think Nikki Haley obviously has the strongest chance in the Republican side if Trump is either incarcerated or for whatever reason is no longer uh, running for office. Um, I think absent something happening to the former president, it is hard to see a path where he is not the Republican nominee. It just, it just is. That, I mean, I'm a numbers guy. The numbers don't lie. It's just very hard to see a path where he's not. Um, I think uh, the current president has gotten a lot of criticism on the way he's handled international affairs. I think starting with the Afghan withdrawal um, and then moving forward. Um, sticking on international, um, there are some interesting polling about uh, approve and disapprove of world leaders. So um, India has the highest at a 77% approval rating of Modi, followed by uh, Mexico, um, Obrador at 64, Switzerland 57, then Poland, Brazil, Australia, Italy, Spain, and the U.S. comes in at a whopping 37% global approval rating of Joe Biden. Non-American citizens don't vote, so why do we care? We care because in this complex, interconnected, international space that we live in right now, the respect and the value of the American president is currently at question. And I think that as we enter into increasingly global conflicts, you have the Russian invasion of Ukraine ongoing, you have the situation in Palestine, you have China, Taiwan, I think American voters see the lack of respect and approval of the current president on the world level as an issue. And rightfully or wrongly, um, they think President Trump was stronger on international policy. Um, I will say, and I see some familiar faces in the room who can echo me on some of this, President Biden has not reversed one of President Trump's China policies, not one. Um, and I think that President Trump was very strong on China, very strong on trade. I think the tariff exemption process could have been done a little differently. Um, you had a negative result of some companies being penalized when the answer truly was, I cannot make this in the U.S. for one reason or another. But the current president not only kept President Trump's China policies, but he doubled down on a reversal of energy policies. So he mandated a certain solar percentage by a certain year. The majority of polysilicon is mined in Xinjiang province. The majority of solar panels are made overseas. So when you put tariffs and restrictive policies on the things you need to reach your American energy goal, and then you penalize American companies for sourcing those from the only place you can source it to reach the arbitrary goal you put into place, that's not a cohesive energy strategy. Um, when the majority of the materials for um, uh, electric batteries and EV cars are made in child mines in North Africa owned by the Chinese, you're not helping anybody. And when you mandate a certain percentage of things in the U.S., knowing that you can only source them from places that have bad child labor laws and bad environmental policy laws, 
then you're not connecting all the dots there. So it's a very disjointed policy. Um, and I'll just, I just threw that in there for whatever reason. I don't remember how I even started with that. Um, in 2023, U.S. consumers spent 11.3% of their disposable income on food. That is the most since 1991. That is not great. If I'm the current president and his team, that is a troubling number for my reelect. Um, however, the productivity in the workforce does look promising. An increase in total factor productivity in back-to-back -back quarters does give economists hope for a truly soft landing and sustained economic growth. Um, we are looking at, at growth right now. Um, so from an economic growth perspective, that is good. From a CPI, consumer price index, and a uh, consumer inflation perspective, there's still some issues. Um, job applicants have increasingly chose um, to, to go back to work uh, to get a higher paycheck. Um, for jobs that pay $200,000 or more, the share of remote work is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's since Q3 of 2022, um, where remote work was about... 60% and now remote work is about 85%. Um, so the return to workforce is happening uh, at least for those $200,000 or higher jobs. Speaking of China, foreign companies are pulling money out of China uh, due to the tensions and due to attractive interest rates elsewhere, but it's at a rate that's frankly, well, you know, it's, it's huge. Uh, foreign direct investment in China has risen by the least since 1993, since 93. So companies are choosing not to invest in China. And that's a result of the original China policies put into place by President Trump that President Biden continued. So, you know, it was much like President Obama trying to claim credit for um, record oil and gas production. Well, it takes seven years for an oil well to come online. So those were all because of policies done by President Bush that Obama tried to take credit for, and we're seeing the same on the China front. Again, this is not partisan, it's just num numbers don't lie. Um, however, when you look at this, what professions support Trump or Biden? The largest percentage by far, 93% of his donors have identified themselves as professors, while less than 7% gave to President Trump. The highest self-identification of donors to President Biden are professors, psychologists, social workers, scientists, and writers. Again, this is how they self-identify. So when you give money to a political candidate, you have to put where you work and your profession, uh, in addition to your address and phone number and all that stuff. So this is, this is completely trackable. It's also self-reported. I don't know why you'd self-report you were a psychologist if you weren't. <laughs> Sounds like you might need to see a psychologist if you did that. Um, uh, the largest margin of support for Trump is construction workers, mechanics, entrepreneurs, truckers, and farmers. So this is really going to come out to who comes out to vote. It really is. Um, I think this is going to be a close election if it's former President Trump and President Biden. Um, but again, if I'm President Biden... The CPI numbers, economic impact numbers, the inflation numbers, those are all going to give me grave concern, but not as much concern as the 89% of Americans who think I'm too old to be reelected. That is something that he physically doesn't have control of overcoming, and that's a very, very troubling number if I'm in the Biden camp. All right, Congress doesn't get off the hook either, and then we're done. Um, Congress has a 70 to 80% disapproval rating since January of 2022. That's not, that's not a great poll. No one ever likes the job Congress is doing when they're asked. Um, they're always like, no, they're terrible. They're horrible. Um, that's not a good poll. Um, current makeup is the House has 219 Republicans, 212 Democrats, and four vacancies. You need 218 to pass anything. That is a slim margin. And all you need are a couple of Matt Gates or MTGs or, or AOCs or, you know, Ileana Omars or whoever to make the whole thing go you know, kerfunk. So um, that is why we have a very dysfunctional uh, congressional makeup at the moment. Um, in the Senate, we've got 48 Democrats, three independents, so basically 51 Democrats and 49 Republicans. You need 50 or 60 votes to pass, depending on if it's a cloture motion or not, or a majority vote. Um, 
also very slim margins. Um, and you would think, oh, slim margins, bipartisanship. No, like hyperpartisan, entrenched, not working together. Um, but, you know, it, it, is, it is what it is. And that's why no one thinks Congress is ever doing a good job. Um, I do think the House has a big challenge ahead of them. Uh, Chairman Richard Hudson is chair of the uh, National Republican Congressional Committee. He's in charge of re-electing House Republicans. He is defending 24 Republican seats that are either in districts that are red but went uh, primarily for Biden or districts that have shift in their dynamic where they are now a much more Democrat-friendly district or have flipped completely. Uh, defending 24 uh, incumbents is a hard thing to do, especially when you currently have a one-vote majority lead. Um, that's not a good position to be in. Um, some of those members are problematic for personal reasons. Uh, Lauren Boebert, for example, has a strong Republican primary. She's a very outspoken individual. Um, but we've seen redistricting in some states like North Carolina that picked up three new Republican seats. And so that will be three North Carolina Dems who are not coming back to Congress. Um, so the maps across the country have given Republicans some hope. And Democrats, I think, are just trying to capitalize on the national uh, anti-Trump movement, secure their base, and then try and um, capitalize with some moderate Democrats in some marginal seats. Um, I think that's going to be very hard for... I think the House is going to be very, very competitive. Very competitive. It's not a slam dunk for anyone. If I was a betting man right now looking at the map, I'd say Democrats take the House. Um, in the Senate, on the other hand, I think it's a different story. So you have 51-49 in the Senate. There are three states that went vehemently for President Trump and that are going to go again for the Republican nominee where the lone statewide elected official who's a Democrat is the sitting singular Democrat U.S. Senator. So in the state of Montana, the only statewide elected Democrat is John Tester. Montana is going to go 13 points for the Republican nominee. In Ohio, the only statewide elected Democrat is uh, Sherrod Brown. Ohio is going to go 8 to 10 points for the Republican nominee. In West Virginia, the only sitting uh, statewide Democrat elected official is Joe Manchin. Uh, Jim Justice, uh, the former governor, has a nominee there. He is very, very popular. Uh, Justice is 100% going to win in West Virginia, and West Virginia is going to go 37 points for the Republican nominee. If Republicans and Steve Daines at the National Republican Senatorial Committee can flip Montana and get a self-funded uh, veteran family man, Tim Sheehy, in there against Tester, and if they can um, get someone in there out of Sherrod Brown, it's either going to be Bernie Moreo, a uh, self-funded guy or the state treasurer, I'm blanking on his name, um, then Republicans take, then, then, then that's, a, that's a dead even split at that point, um, re, you know, reversing the 51-49, and then Republicans have chances to pick up in Pennsylvania, uh, Arizona, um, keeping Texas, Ted Cruz is going to have a tough race, um, but if I was a betting man, I'd, right now, right now, this, this is going to probably change in an hour, uh, I'd say that the House flips to Democrat, the Senate flips to Republican, and we can flip a coin for the White House at this point. That's all the rambling that I have. Uh, thank you all for the questions. I'm happy to entertain some more questions for the last two minutes we have, and then I'm happy to stick around and chat with folks afterwards if we want. Do you think the Browning mates will have a lot to do with that for the presidential race? I think for Biden it will because of his age and his... Um, Kamala's measuring hurts. Excuse me? Kamala was measuring hurts. Yeah, I think that hurts President Biden, though. Um, as unpopular as uh, President Biden and Trump might be, Kamala Harris is, is wildly, wildly unpopular. Um, she doesn't pull well with the African-American community. Um, and Trump picks Tom Cotton. That would be interesting. I, 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 I would bet right now that's not going to happen, but I think that would be interesting. I think that would be interesting. Um, I think Trump has to pick a female if the running mate for Biden is Kamala. Um, there. Oh, he is. I'm, yeah, he is. He is. There's a lot of females out there who are who are veterans as well. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard is a name that a lot of people have been talking about. Um, she would bring over some of those independents. Um, there have been some other other names out there too, but the Tom Cotton would be interested. I don't, I don't know if that helps Trump demographically or geographically. That's the only reason I said Tim Scott, Tim Scott would be a great pick. I think, uh, yeah, Tim Scott would be a great pick. I think, um, 
South Carolina is what tomorrow? Yeah. Um, I, you know. It, oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I think so. I think Trump. I think Nikki Haley losing in, in South Carolina definitely uh, didn't help and showed that. But I, I I like diversity on tickets. Period. I personally like him. He, he's a great man. He really is. Yes, sir. Sorry, I have two questions. They're a little bit more broad. So one, I, I was just curious in your experience if you have to navigate, uh, you know, like partisan divides between different government levels. So say you're in like a really democratic state and the uh, House is in a year that's been that's controlled by Republicans, but you want to get your agenda met through all levels. How do you kind of navigate that space between two different legislatures? And then like how micro do you actually get? And then the second question is even broader is, what do you think has changed since Citizens United and lobbying? So the first question, um, yeah, it's it's hard. And every state's different. And I'm finding that out literally trial by fire right now. Um, so Delaware, for example, uh, very much focuses as a uh, caucus state. So if you get the Democrat leadership in Delaware House and Senate to sign off on blocking something, they're not going to let it move. So if you have a Republican who's introduced a bill you want to kill and you get the Democrats on your side and they say, yeah, we're not going to give him a win, then you're done. Um, in states where Republicans have the supermajority, North Carolina, for example, if you get um, Republican leadership on board, you're basically good to go with, with whatever you need. Uh, in states that are more balanced, you really then have to work the policy, and it's less the politics. So you have to make sure you have Republicans and Democrats on board. Uh, in Virginia, actually, there's a my guys are there right now. There's a hearing literally happened as I was walking in, so I don't know how that turned out. But Virginia is uh, controlled by, they have de 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 Democrats have the majority in Virginia, but it's by one seat in both the House and the Senate. So very, very narrow. Um, but you have to have bipartisan support for things in Virginia or they're just not going to get through. So um, it 100% varies state by state. Um, thankfully for what I'm doing currently, veterans issues are typically bipartisan. So it's just about finding the right mix that works for the state versus playing partisan politics, if that makes sense. Um, to your second question on Citizens United, I mean, look, there's there's so much material out there on was it good? Was it bad? Is it a violation of freedom of speech? Is it not? Um, you know, I personally think there should be term limits. There should be age limits for various reasons. But, um, you know, I do think, again, I think it it's pretty constitutional that you have the right of freedom of expression. And if you choose to do that through financial means, you know, I, I don't know. I'm personally torn, but there's tons of literature out there that smarter people, trust me, way, way smarter than me, have written on this topic. Well, that I'm I would more interested in your personal story, though. How, do you, how, how have you seen things change? That's more, more what I'm asking. I mean, I haven't because there's still super PACs. The congressional offices can launch their... Standard pack, their leadership pack, their reelect pack. I mean, all of those have limits, but they just create more. You just create more. I mean, yeah. So I haven't seen a change. Thank you. Personally. Yes, sir. Uh, is there a chance? I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know what? We're going to have to end soon because we have a class that's going to come in at 630. But uh, if we could all give a hand to Mr. Schiller.